conference. And what I'm going to talk about today is really a continuation of Günther's talk yesterday. So we're going to think of the gaps of the fossil records and ask the question whether it's possible for genetic mechanism, neo-Darwinian mechanism based on mathematics to, to explain those gaps or do we get too long waiting times? So that is the question I'm going to, and this is really a joint ongoing work with Ginter and um, Gauger. So, Excuse me, sir, is it possible that you'll be in front of the microphone? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's going to be much easier for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So let me give the outline. Since uh, uh, Günther gave his excellent talk yesterday, I will be very brief about giving some paleontological, biological motivation of examples of fossil gaps. And then we need to have a genetic model, some genetic neo-Darwinian attempt to explain those gaps. And I will talk about a number of coordinated mutations that change not the coding regions themselves, but we'll make it easier, only change the expression of genes to uh, evolve some new organ system, for instance. And then we need the mathematics, so we will bring in population genetics into that genetic model and that will lead us to some expressions for the waiting time in order to bridge those gaps. So I will present some formulas and then give numerical examples. And finally, that leads us to the conclusions is it possible to bridge those gaps? So here we have some examples of, of, of gaps of the fossil record. Um, Günther mentioned several of them yesterday. We have the origin of animal, animal flights in birds and bats, for instance. We have origin of echolocation in waves and bats, origin of complex eyes, bony fish evolution, origin of reproductive systems, origin of man, origin of photosynthesis in cyanobacteria, and so on. And in all these examples, the new organ systems have to evolve, and that requires several coordinated mutations. So let's look at just an example from the first, uh, the first example, origin of, uh, of flight or origin of feathers in the supposed transition from dinosaurs to birds. So in this paper, the authors suggest that it should uh, uh, take place in several steps. First, some cylinder grows out, and then branches from that cylinder, and then several other steps until we finally get the fully evolved feather. So let's systemize this program a bit. So we have some organ system that needs to evolve uh, in order to explain this gap of the fossil record. So let's assume that we would want to have a genetic neo-Darwinian explanation of that, that uh, gap. So we, we first need to estimate the time length of the discontinuity using radiometric techniques. Then we propose some genetic mechanisms with several coordinated mutations. So in the feather example, let's say that we, uh, we need a changed expression uh, of three genes, for instance. So then we have a proposed genetic mechanism, and then we uh, put in population genetics and get, at the end, some expected waiting time. There are a number of parameters in this model. I will come back to those parameters. Uh, that would give us an expected waiting time. And then we compare the analytical and mathematical waiting time in step four with the estimated time length of uh, obtained from the radiometric techniques in step two, and 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 then w uh, we can address or answer the question whether the model was reasonable. If the waiting time here is a lot longer than the the the, the time gap length from obtained from the radiometric techniques, then it seems that the neo-Darwinian model has problems, at least with this kind of genetic model. So I will mainly talk about step four here or only talk about step four. So this is sort of bringing it into a wider concept. So let's assume now we look at uh, a genetic model for the origin of, origin of feathers, for instance. Let's say that it, we need uh, changes of three genes. Uh, so, and as I said, we will make it easier for the neo-Darwinian model. And we will not assume evolution of any uh, coding DNA in terms of novel genes. We will only look at 
changed expression of genes that already are in place. So that is an easier waiting time problem. So we, we can depict it in this way, whereas Brian, he talked about changes of the, of the, of the cooling regions themselves in order to get new proteins. Uh, I would look at, look at changes of gene expression. So it's, assume that we need changes at three genes in order to uh, have a new uh, evolved feather. Then we have the coding regions of these three genes here. And in a certain order, we need to have the, the, the mutations come along. And then in the promoter region of each gene, we, uh, we have a regulatory sequence of length, typically 1,000 nucleotides. The green one is the regulatory sequence of gene 1. The red one is the regulatory sequence of gene 2. And the regulatory sequence of, of uh, uh, gene 3, uh, gene 3 I depict in blue color. So we will only look at mutations in these three. In this case, I have three genes. We will look at, at mutations in these three regulatory sequences. And together, I call them a regulatory array. So that is our, we look at mutations in the regulatory array. And uh, it ha then we will, transcription factors, they will bind to short subsequences of, the, of each regulatory sequence of length 6 to 10 nucleotides. So, so that means that we could have a mutations anywhere along each uh, uh, regulatory sequence, as long as we get a subsequence a bind binding site that matches what the transcription factor wants to have. Because when, then when the transcription factor uh, attaches that binding site, the, the expression of the gene will change. So in this particular example, we add a time scale here uh, so that uh, we, after, uh, when we start, we don't have any, any correct binding sites in place. We start with a selection coefficient of one uh, and then after some time, there is a mutation in the f somewhere along the first regulatory region. And, uh, 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 and, and that new system has a new selection coefficient, S1. So if it's a deleterious mutation, S1 is less than 1. And if it's beneficial, S1 is larger than 1. And, and, uh, and then uh, this mutation has to spread to the rest of the population. That's where population genetics come, comes in. Then after some additional time, we have a mutation uh, here, uh, somewhere along the second regulatory sequence. And, and that mutation then has to, appears in one individual, and it has to spread to the rest of the population, and so on. And finally, we get a mutation uh, in the third regulatory sequence somewhere. And then when that mutation has spread to the whole population, we are done. Then we have reached the target, and that is our waiting time. So now we will bring in the population in this, because at each time point, some individuals may have acquired zero, one, two, or three mutations. We have to look at the whole profile. So let us depict the population horizontally. So this is really the po population size, or actually the effective population size. So at the first time point, no individual has acquired any mutation. Here we have the first successful mutation in the first regulatory sequence that will later on spread to the whole population. So at this time point, 25% of the individuals have acquired that mutation. And then later on, all individuals have acquired that uh, uh, first mutation. And then uh, at some later time point here, we have a second successful mutation in the second uh, regulatory sequence. And at this time point, later on, 15% of the individuals have acquired that second mutation. And before that, mutation spreads to the whole population. Among one of those individuals with two mutations in place in the first and second regulatory sequence, some individual gets the third uh, mutation. And uh, the offspring of that individual spreads uh, uh, and take over the population so that uh, all three individuals get, uh, all three mutations get fixed in the population. And then we, and that is the final time, waiting time. And that is called a 
And Martin Novak has done lots of research search on this. That is called a stochastic tunneling event. We, 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 we go from one mutation to three uh, with two mutations as a small intermediate step. And this is very complicated in terms of population genetics, but for a small or intermediately sized population, we can simplify because most individuals will look the same genetically. So we can look at the... Con because what I'm interested in is the regulatory array. You remember these three regulatory sequences. How do they look genetically? So we will look, say that we take the majority uh, regulatory array in the population at each time point. So that means that the, here we have a white color, here we have a white, green, 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 blue. So that would lead us to this kind of model. Because then we can, at, we can depict the, the population at each time point as one single state of a, of, a, of a marker process, more specifically a Moran process. And I represent the state we, uh, in terms of a binary sequence of length three. So that means that uh, this means that we have acquired the mutation at the first, first regulatory sequence, that is a one, not at the second regulatory sequence and not at the third one. And here we haven't acquired the, re the required mutation at, at any of the three regulatory sequences. And the final state is the binary sequence of, of one, one, one. And that corresponds to the final target when we have acquired the mutation at all three regulatory sequences. So we can remember we had three regulatory sequences uh, next to the, in the promoter regions of the three genes. And then I put them horizontally on top of each other. And that is our regulatory array. So when we start, we have this profile, no mutations yet. That corresponds to states 0, 0, 0. Then we get somewhere along the first regulatory sequence and mutation so that we enter state 1, 0, 0. And then because of stochastic tunneling, we have a direct jump from this state to 1, 1, 1. Uh, because we sort of skip uh, only a few. Uh, while there are still only a few red individuals, we get the third mutation. So now we will look more into the states of this Marco process. So that needs, we no, need to look more closely into re the regulatory arrays. So let, as I said, a regulatory array is typically of length 1,000 nucleotides. But for the purpose of illustration, I will give a toy example where it has length 20. So we will see what happens, really. So we have these three regulatory arrays. And for each one of them, we have a, one or two targeted binding sites. And that means that the transcription factor needs to attach to such a target or such a target in the first regulatory sequence. Uh, some transcription factors, they want to have a perfect match, and that is a, that is a, a pink subsequence. But others can also tolerate a mismatch of one subsequence. So then the, the, the yellow uh, subsequence is okay as well, because then it, it hits this G, 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 G target. Uh, and for the, along the second regulatory sequence, we don't have a perfect match anywhere. This is the best, the closest we come, a distance of one. And at the third regulatory sequence, we are already in place. So this regulatory array, what state of the Markov process does it correspond to? Well, that depends on how many mismatches we tolerate. So if it's the case, now I will depict the eight states of the Markov process as all the eight possible binary sequences. If it's the case that the transcription factor requires a perfect match, no mismatches, then we are actually in this state here. Because we don't have a, yet the perfect match here, because there is a G mismatch. On the other hand, if we tolerate a mismatch of one, then we are already at the final target state, the blow state. Uh, so when we look at this mathematically, it's a Markov process along this state space. So we start randomly. We could be very lucky and start here. But that's very unlikely. But we, we have some initial distribution among the fi non-final states. And then we have rays between these states. And that gives us an expression of the waiting time to reach the final <coughs> state. And uh, let's look at this more closely. So in general, when we have M genes, we have 
binary sequences of length m, but in these specific examples we had three genes, so that gives us eight states. So what we need to have in order to compute the waiting time analytically is first of all the, the initial probabilities. So P100, that is a probability that random regulatory array happens to start here. And that means that the first regulatory sequence we actually by chance uh, uh, get a, a, a fit with a targeted binding site. Uh, and then we compute those probability for all non-final states, all states all except the blue one, and put them into vector P. Then we also need the transition rates between all pairs of states. And we compute the transition rates be between all non-final states and put them into a matrix. And also along the diagonal, we take the minus rates of leaving each state. And that gives us not only the expected waiting time, but also the distribution of the waiting time. That's a t the time until a marker process hits the final state. It's called a phase type distribution, and it can easily be uh, expressed in terms of the vector P of initial probabilities of, of the non-final states. That is where we start, uh, and, that is, and then the rates between all states uh, that, were, that we put into a matrix. So then we get the whole distribution of the waiting time, and in particular, we get the ex expected waiting time here. So it looks very simple, but the difficult part is to compute these probabilities and these transition rates. That requires a lot of work, because it, it, it depends on all the models of the parameters, and there are many models. So now I will uh, put them to default values and give numerical examples of waiting times. And, uh, and then we will vary one or two at a time, just to give a flavor and, 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 uh, uh, of what is happening. So, our default parameter uh, population size or effective population size of 1,000, mutation rate 10 to minus 8 per generation and nucleotide. Do we allow back mutations? Yes. Uh, a case where you don't allow for back mutation is Richard Dawkins' famous example of climbing Mount Improbable. Then you have, when you, once you have acquired a mutation, it is fixed, you cannot lose it. But as a default here, we allow for back mutations. Uh, the length of the regulatory region is 1,000. The length of the binding site, that was a subsequence of the regulatory sequence, is 6. The number of targeted binding sites, I had two for the first, in example, for the third regulatory sequence, then one and one, but now I have one possible targeted binding site for all, and the allowed mismatch is zero as a default parameter. And I, 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 the default is a completely neutral model, so all the states are, are, have selection, selection coefficients of one. So let's look first of how does the expe expected waiting time in terms of number of generation depend on the number of genes and whether we allow for back mutations or not. So let's look at uh, the case when we don't allow for back mutations. So for one gene, the waiting time is approximately, in this specific example, uh, 50 million generations. Uh, so that would be, uh, if we have a generation time of 20 years, that would translate to uh, 1 billion years. And then it uh, approximately grows linearly with the number of genes. And that's quite uh, reasonable when we don't allow for back mutations. If we allow for back mutation, it's another story. At the, we start with the same number up here, but then it grows much more quickly. And in here, it's the two orders, of two orders of magnitude larger when we allow for back mutations compared with when we don't. And you, it's actually possible to prove that the waiting time grows linearly with the number of genes when we don't allow for back mutation, but it essentially grows exponentially with the number of genes when we allow for back mutation. So that's, that matters a lot. Uh, let's look at the second example where we have two genes and how, and how is the waiting time impacted by the length of the binding site and the, required, the maximal required mismatch. How much can the transcription factor tolerate and it's natural, the longer the regulatory sequence is, the, then, it, then the waiting time gets shorter because we have more opportunities. But the longer the binding site is, then it gets more difficult because we need a longer substring to match. Uh, 
So, and the waiting time actually increases exponentially with the length of the binding site. And that is not very surprising that it does. Uh, and, and we see that the waiting times are very high. It's 20, 200 million generations when we have just one gene and then it grows exponentially. However, the miss maximal allowable mismatch is extremely important. If we allow one mismatch, the, the, the expected waiting time drops a lot uh, because there are many more subsequences that could match uh, the target. And if we allow for two mismatches at both genes, then we are, by, uh, uh, we, we are already in place. The waiting time is 10 to minus 11. That means that the probability is, is in principle one, that, uh, uh, that randomly we find subsequences of both regulatory sequences that match uh, the targeted binding site with a maximum distance of two. Uh, still, the expected waiting time grows even here. Uh, it grows then exponentially but it, uh, with the number of, of uh, the length of the binding site, but it starts from a much smaller value. Then we can take, let's now, the final example, let's Let's uh, uh, drop the assumption of neutrality. So again, we look at the system with two genes. The first, we start with a, a selection coefficient of one. Uh, and then uh, uh, when both mutations are in place, we either have a neutral model or a beneficial model. But the intermediate state is slightly deleterious, not very much. The selection coefficient is very close to one, but slightly smaller. And remember how much more that depends on the population size. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, <coughs> in this case, we have a population size of 10,000. Uh, in the previous examples, the population size does not enter the waiting time. I can uh, explain, but here it comes in the sensitivity to the selection coefficients. So I have two scenarios here. Uh, the intermediate state is deleterious, but in scenario one, Remember, we have two genes that it's only one. There are two possible paths from where if we start here to the final target. If it's the case that it is deleterious when we get a mutation at the first <coughs> gene, but it's still neutral if we start with a mutation at the second gene first, then it's much easier compared to this is more irre an irreducible complexity situation. If we only have one part, whether it, it, it is at the first or second gene, then it has a lower fitness. So this is really irreducible complexity. This is not really, because we have one neutral path to go here. So let's start with scenario one, when the final state is neutral. So we start with neutral, and we end with a neutral model. But the intermediate state is one path, of the one possibility of the intermediate state is uh, deleterious. And in this case, we see that we start with 200 million generations, and then when we decrease, when we make these states more and more deleterious, the waiting time increases, but not, it, 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 it increases by like 60, 70%, and then it stabilizes, because after a while, S1 gets so small that this road is blocked, but we can still take this road. So, uh, and, and the same happens when the final state is slightly, it's highly beneficial, it's just that the waiting times are lowered. But it's the same phenomenon. We start with 20 million years here, uh, uh, generations, and then we, after, when this number has been doubled, we sort of, it, the curve levels off. But now we get to the irreducible complexity situation, and then it's dramatically different, because it, we start with 20 million generations, and then we only drop selection coefficient from 1 to 0 0.99, and the waiting time increases by five orders of magnitude. And it's practically impossible to pass in two intermediate states. And that's very important. And the larger the population gets, the more difficult it is. And this includes the tunnel? So, yeah. No, no, uh, uh, yes, it includes the tunnel. But now, but if the final state is highly beneficial, then tunneling helps, because it comes here then it only increases by two order of magnitude. But if we have a more challenging 
irreducible complexity situation with five genes or something, then it will be difficult even for stochastic tunneling to help. Remember, stochastic tunneling means that maybe a few individuals have these states, and then the, uh, the offspring they, uh, will die out, but before they do, the second uh, mutation comes along. And that will help in this case a little bit, but not in the first case. Uh, it will help when the final stage is highly beneficial. So that leads us to the conclusions. We have a formula for not only the expected value, but I showed you numerically the expected value, but you could have the whole distribution of the waiting time, the median, the variance, the, all the quantiles, and so on. Of course, it's an approximation, it's a model, but we, we, we have a formula for the waiting time until several genes change expression in a coordinated way. Uh, and then we have a number of parameters of the model, effective population size, number of genes, mutation rate, do we allow back mutations or not, the selection coefficients of all the in intermediate steps, uh, the length of the regulatory sequence, the length of the binding site, and the number of possible binding sites at each regulatory sequence, and finally the maximally allowed mismatch between the targeted binding site and and the subsequence of the regulatory sequence in order for the uh, transcription factor to attach. So uh, this is preliminary. So I I now we, the important thing here is to, because, uh, to put realistic parameter values into each model and analyze each model separately. And that's where we are now. So we need, a lot, I mean, we need uh, Günther's and Anne's expertise here to, put, put, to get realistic parameter values. But my, my intuition as a mathematician is that it seems that for many realistic examples, even now when we only change expression of genes, we don't change the coding regions themselves, the waiting time seems too long for many realistic parameter settings when we compare to the length of, from the fossil record with the radiometric techniques. So, and here I end with some references. Uh, we have uh, one, we have written two papers. The first one is published as a chapter of a Springer book. The second paper is uh, submitted. And uh, here are some other papers. For instance, some papers by Martin Novak and his collaborators. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you.